Hi everyone and welcome back to DCM, Doritos Connections and Mountain Dew, your favorite local video game talk show. I am your host, Howard Miller. And I'm your co-host, David Scrivani. And let's start off with the news. First up in the news today, just announced on the day we are recording this, uh, the Alien franchise is making a triumphant return to the world of gaming with Aliens Fireteam, a third-person, three-player co-op survival shooter, let's try saying that five times fast, set 23 years after the events of Alien 3 instead of Aliens. Who, who would have thought? Players will take the role of a colonial marine tasked with various jobs to do, all of which come with the benefit, question mark, of taking down swaths of xenomorphs featuring five classes of Marines to choose from, each with their own customization and upgrade paths, Fireteam definitely shows promise. Uh, there's no concrete release date just yet, but the developer, Cold Iron Studios, says the game is planned for a release this summer. Everyone loves Aliens 3! I know, right? Because when I think of the Alien franchise, the first thing I think of is Alien 3. I love it. I, I've actually been meaning to rewatch it, because apparently because the, like, the director's cut is supposed to be really good, but I've never actually seen it. It was a director's cut? Well, it's not a director's cut, because I think David Fincher, like, has distanced himself from that movie, but, like, it's the assembly cut. Like, the editors got together and made it better. Ah. Apparently, it's really good. I've never seen it, though. For our next story, we're going to take a little quick roundup of what's been going on this year so far with the, one of the biggest video game companies in the world, Blizzard. And we'll start with what they've been doing with the company Vicarious Visions. Hint, it's not good. Not good at all. For those who don't know what Vicarious Vision is, it's a video game developer that's been around since the 90s making game series like Crash Bandicoot, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, every Guitar Hero from Guitar Hero 3 onwards, and the Skylanders series. They were owned by Activision since 2005 and they just released Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 HD, which was a critical and commercial success winning awards left and right. Along with that, they announced that they were making a remaster of Diablo 2 which everyone has been wanting. So Activision saw this as an opportunity to reward the studio by dissolving it and merging it into Blizzard. Congrats on making a phenomenal, critically acclaimed, commercially successful game. Here's, what, here's, here's your consolation prize. And their consolation prize is they are making skins for the video game Overwatch. That's right. If you thought the people who made a skateboarding game would be good at making costumes for people in a video game, why would you ever think that? I d what? <laughs> now, see, see, what are the chances now that we get Tony Hawk as a playable character in Overwatch? Oh, to see him in that gross Pixar style. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, now, now, this also dashes anyone's hope for a remaster of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3 in 4 HD, or even a Tony Hawk Pro Skater 6, along with the fact that I think they're going to release the Diablo 2 remaster. We don't even know if it's technically fully done by Vicarious Vision at this point. All we know is that they're gone. So, Blizzard needs this extra studio in Blizzard internally. So, what do they have coming out this year? They announced... Nothing. Everything has been pushed back into 2022. This includes Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4. But however, they did show us some teasers of Overwatch 2, showing us the new interesting character designs of Overwatch 2, where it looks exactly the same. Every character looks the same. I gotta Thank say, I, I, I saw those on Twitter, but I, 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 I didn't see them from like any official source, so I kind of just assumed they were memes, because like, these are the new character designs? That can't be real. Those are too generic. They're too, they're too similar to the original ones. These can't be real. Boy, was I wrong. Now, in the, in the worst part is, that now they're gonna have Vicarious Visions make the same costume for the character. <laughs> <laughs> you got rid of one of your highest selling games to make costumes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. That's, that's, that's the price of success, I guess, in the, in the video game industry. Awful. 
Also in the news, apparently it's 1999 again because an Illinois state representative by the name of Marcus C. Evans Jr. is attempting once again to ban the sale of violent video games to children underage with a penalty of up to $1,000. The proposed law would also change the definition of what a violent video game is to being any game that allows a user or player to control a character within a video game that is encouraged to perpetuate human-on-human -human violence in which the player kills or otherwise causes serious physical or psychological harm to another human or animal. Regardless of the fact that this basically covers literally all video games in existence, Super Mario Brothers included, what underage kid do you know, Howard? has the income to be able to pay a $1,000 fine. Hmm, you know... For playing a kids, video game. All those kids with their lemonade stands nowadays, it's just a racketeering scam. I guess so, I guess so. I mean, you you know me, we're, we're, we're good friends, we, 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 we're, we're, we're blood brothers. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> the original Doom, which is which was one of the games that, back in the 90s, was a big perpetual perpetuation of the whole violent video games thing. It was one of the first games I ever played, to the point where I don't even remember playing it all the way back then. I have to go on my dad's word, because he said, oh yeah, we, I, I, I fired up and you, I, you, I put you on my lap and we played Doom. I'm like, I have no memory of this. I have no memory of this at all. I turned out okay. I'm not a violent murderer, as far as I know. <laughs> but in all serious, uh, there's no link. There's no link, there's no link between playing violent video games and committing actual violent acts. I mean, the popularity of Call of Duty, of Fortnite, and God knows how many others, that, that just proves it, you know? They, I, yeah, it's not scientific, I'm not, I, I'm not a, I don't have any PhDs or anything, I, I don't officially know what I'm talking about. However, like, people on. with PhDs have done multiple case studies also agreeing with us idiots. Exactly. So we have a leg up on this. There we know. We, multiple. We, so technically, we do know what we're talking. We just don't have the, the credentials. Uh, the credentials. Thank you. That was the word I was looking for. Ba bam. But uh, yeah, and also th the term is so incredibly vague, and I, and I hate to be that guy, but like we invented the ESRB rating for a reason. For a reason. So parents, when you buy a video game, you can take the box, then flip it over. In the corner, it'll tell you what's bad about the game. Mm-hmm. And then you can look up on their website what each thing means. So if you don't want your kid to have suggestive themes, look at the back of the box and don't get it for your kid. And also, GameStop doesn't allow you to let kids buy video games without parental approval, so a parent has to be there anyway. So what kid is going and buying Mortal Kombat 11 by himself then committing violent acts? My man's going to get a grappling hand, grappling hook installed in his hand and just get over here. Yeah, the kid's going to just be, freeze everything whenever he touches. Yeah, because that's incredibly realistic. There's, yeah. There, there's just no, this just feels like either the politician wants attention or he's just... Bored. He's bored because it's been disproven. Uh, it's gonna multiple be dis times. Multiple times by multiple case studies with people with multiple PhDs, way more than us. And uh, the fact that we have to continue talking about this in Stupid. 2021, in current year, <laughs> we're still talking about this. Absolutely silly. It's unbelievable, truly. Bonkers, some might say. Even, even wacky. Yeah. I, I, I would put, put that. That politician's a certified wackadoo. <laughs> <laughs> now, you might be at home watching this thinking, David, Howard, what are, your, what are your thoughts on the GameStop stock situation? You know, everyone's talking about it. It's all the rage. Well, we're here to put your, your fears to rest. Here, here, here's our real thoughts on the situation. And that's it, because I really have no idea how to describe any of that. Yeah, I don't know anything about stocks, but yeah, that's about it. Yep. And now for our next segment, hey guys, what you been playing?
So what have I been playing? Well, I've been playing the re-release of Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the movie, the game. Complicated title, but I swear, stay with me, it's good. The game was released in 2010 to coincide with the movie that came out that has the same name, X the Game part of the title. And uh, it was taken off of all digital storefronts in 2014. Also, not to mention, that was when it was PS3 and Xbox 360. We're not in that time period anymore. So they took it off of all digital stores. And there's no physical copies or discs to play it on. So you had to pirate it to play it. However, Ubisoft decided that in January, to everyone's enjoyment, they re-released it with all the DLC the game had. What is it? It's a game that follows the movie based on the comics of the same name as you play as Scott Pilgrim on his quest to defeat Ramona Flowers' seven evil exes. It's a four-player co-op beat-em-up where you fight hipsters throughout the streets of Ontario, Canada. Play as Scott, Ramona, Stephen, Kim, Knives, and Wallace fighting every evil ex so Scott can live happily ever after with Ramona. The game features some fantastic music by chiptune band Anamanaguchi, and the gameplay is excellent as you can just throw dudes at each other, call for ninja assists, or just throw a stop sign at somebody. It pays homage to games that inspired it, like Streets of Rage, because, you know, it's also just a great game in general, both of them. But it also is full of so much comic book Easter eggs for the original fans of the series. I personally find this to be one of my favorite beat-em-ups of all time, and I love the comic. So this is like a match made in heaven. It even got a run featured on the website Limited Game Runs, which everyone has been asking ever since the website started if they could do a physical re-release of Scott Pilgrim vs. the World the Game. But now they got it! And it comes with cool stuff, like a redrawn cover of Sonic Adventure 1 with Scott doing the Sonic pose, it got drumsticks, and there's even a vinyl repressing of the soundtrack. Can't pre-order it anymore by the time this comes out, but you should still visit the website anyways. They always have some fun exclusive runs. And right now, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World The Game is available on Xbox consoles, PlayStation consoles, and PC. As for what I've been playing recently, I've been replaying Batman Arkham Knight. Uh, the third and final game in Rocksteady's Arkham trilogy, Arkham Knight is massive, both in scope and storytelling. Uh, the game map is one of the most detailed and interesting maps I've seen in an open world game, personally, and there's so much to do. Sure, some side missions can get a little repetitive, and the 243 various Riddler challenges are just a little annoying to get all of. You have to get them all if you want to access the true full ending of the game, unfortunately. But, but Rocksteady have very much polished the gameplay of their series to, I would say, pristine quality. Uh, the combat, which has always been one of the franchise's hallmarks, feels almost perfect at times. Some of the best in-game combat you could find anywhere. I don't even find the game's reliance on the Batmobile that annoying. I mean, I think the tank sections feels real, really fun, although some chase sections, particularly during the Although chase sections, particularly during the Firefly side mission, can quickly end very poorly if the car gets caught on a piece of the world's geometry and you have to spend a full 10 seconds trying to get the car back into place to continue driving. And by the time you actually get back into place, uh, they've gotten away and you've got to wait for the spawn point to come back into the world. It's not, it's not fun. <laughs> Story-wise, though, uh, I personally feel the game falls a little short from its previous installments. A lot of the things work, uh, but one thing, really the main conflict, the titular conflict, uh, is almost an eye-rollingly lazy choice, but I've softened a bit on that particular plot point in the last six years since the game's launch. Uh, it's certainly one of the best comic book video games out there. Uh, Batman Arkham Knight is now available on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. And now, it's time for our discussion segment. Or as we like to call it, the bullying segment. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Ready, Captain One? Let's go! You are freelancers. As you can see from our little title, today's uh, discussion is we are going to bully Anthem. We bullied Cyberpunk last time. And the Game Awards. And the Game Awards. And Nintendo. And we bullied oh. a lot of... We were, we, were, mean. we were really mean last time. We were angry. I have no problems with that. Uh, yeah, let's go. Uh, so Anthem is this game created by Bioware, and I think it released in 20... 
it 2019 at this point? Uh, it would have been either 2018 or 2019. 2018, 2019. The game came out, and it was one of EA's game service games where they believe that single player games do not hold people's attentions enough so they have to put in multiplayer elements in order to keep people focused uh and that uh they did that for mass effect andromeda game flopped so they thought let's do it for anthem and guess what the game was not only a critical failure uh, it was a commercial failure as literally six months after the game came out you can find it for like five dollars at like Walmarts and they're like please just take this game employees tell people to not buy anthem no one liked anthem everyone hated it you can probably find someone willing to pay you to take the game yeah I know and listen you can like whatever game you like that's totally fine but if you're one of the five people who liked anthem I'm so sorry so so sorry because they decided they're going to pull what Final Fantasy XIV did. Release a not good game, and then in one year they're going to completely redo the whole game via one expansion that will completely change how the game works, functions, plays, and generally might even change the story. So they announced they were going to do that with Anthem. And after about a while of nothing, then more nothing, uh, it just so happens that they're canceling it now. Anthem 2.0, or Anthem Next, they didn't really have an official term, has been canceled. And a year after development. That game sucks. I don't... I don't understand. They tried... I don't understand why they tried to redo the whole game if it failed and bombed financially. I guess they were hoping people would still buy it once they announced it and then no one bought it. Because yeah, did they even say anything as to what this expansion was going to include? No, they just said it was going to rehaul the whole game. Which so people... they promised things but were entirely vague about what things were going to be included and just kind of hoped for the best. Yes. And I... Not how it works, Bioware. Sorry to say. And uh, to make matters worse, this could have been a case because Final Fantasy XIV, when it came out, trash. Boring, bland. One expansion where they fixed everything, one of the most popular games on PlayStation. Destiny was kind of like that too, right? Destiny was like that too as well. Destiny was also like that. So these are... And people love Destiny now. Yeah, everyone loves Destiny. But uh, Anthem tried to do it. Mm, no, they canceled it. And because... so. Where are we going forward? Well, EA has decided. They compared it to their other successful games, and they managed to <laughs> they managed to say that due to the flop of Mass Effect Andromeda and Anthem, they're canceling their single-player games being game services due to the su uh, success of Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. So now, if someone comes up to EA and says, I want to make a single-player game, they're not going to force multiplayer and force really stupid changes to it to make it easily accessible to the public. People can just make single-player games because of Star Wars. And they also announced that Dragon Age 4 was also going to be one of these games and now can be a single-player game, which why would you make every single-player game have multiplayer in, in, like, in it? Well, how, how are you? you, you got to you know consider you know the the success they've had with the, all the other dragon age games being games as a service obviously it's it's going it's going to have to work and it's like all the po the most popular games as a service game dragon the dragon age series it's like it's like this that was like, sarcasm if you guys weren't aware dragon age the dragon age series is not games as a yeah, service yeah it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a strategy it's like i don't know like an rpg why would it be multiplayer? What would you have as multiplayer? The multiplayer isn't even like a, mo a separate multiplayer mode. They force online interactions into your game when you're playing by yourself. Mass Effect 1 had, um, had a craft building system, and the only way you can get the rarer materials is if you did online missions, or you just sent a bot to do it. It's, 
stupid. Anthem, there was a giant open world in which everyone can just roam around. But it wasn't really an open world. It was kind of just like a giant circle with caves in it. It's, it's unbelievable the amount of bad business decisions that went with that game. And I'm very glad that now, like, they're just going to let single-player games be single-player Yeah, who, who would have thought, like, something good would happen in the video game industry? And, like, the, the wide video game industry? It, I, who'd have thunk? Who would think? And it, and it only took a game that had eight years of development to release, no one buy it, and then no one liked it. Look, I know, I know it's the whole, there's a meme, like, ha EA bad, but, like, come on. Come on. They're, they're going to do something good now. I know. It's, it's, it's shocking. So, uh, I mean, between, between this and between the incredible turnaround that Battlefront 2 had, Star Wars Battlefront 2, th things are looking up, I feel. Things are looking up. Except for their sports games. Their sports games are awful. Yeah. However, baby steps. So as much as we're going to bully Anthem, in the end, Dragon Age 4 might not be garbage. Yeah. And they're making more Star Wars games, which is, that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's rad. Good job. Good job. Small victories. Small victories. Anthem sucks. Yeah. And now it's time for a brief clip from our interview with Stuttering Craig from Screw Attack. and welcome back to DCM, your favorite local video game show. Uh, I'm, of course, your host, Howard, and today I have a living legend in the video game community. Uh, <laughs> you, you know it. Uh, we have owner and co-founder of Screw Attack, co-founder of Game Attack, and now his own gaming podcast. Welcome to Craig Skistimist. Uh, oh my goodness, I messed up on your name so bad. Nailed it. Nailed oh, it. I did? I did. No. Not at all. No, 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 no close. It's close. Skistimus is good. Yeah, for Skistimus. sure. Skistimus, okay. Uh, yeah. How are you doing tonight? Doing great, buddy. Doing great, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here, of course. Uh, so first, I just want to mention, uh, what, what was Screw Attack? Because that's what I mainly want to talk about. What was Screw Attack for our audience at home? Yeah, so... Yeah, so Screw Attack, like everyone thinks about YouTube right now as like the place to go to watch stuff. Like it's this place for everything. But Screw Attack was kind of YouTube before YouTube. It was this place where you found, uh, found all your gaming content. If you were into video games at the time, it was like this centralized hub uh, where you found not just gaming content, but like an amazing community. And uh, it was way ahead of its time. Uh, I'd say it was, it was perfect for its time. How's that? It, and it went from uh, 2006 to about... 2000, technically 2017, but really it ended around 2014. So um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a really good run, um, great place. And we, we were known for making original content every day, which uh, at the time was not a thing. People <laughs> didn't do that. So uh, it, was, it was a great time. Because I remember at the time, uh, YouTube did not like video game footage. So like there was all these sites uh, and, and TV channels like G4 were, that would be like the centralized, you know, not, you know, hub in a little subculture of the gaming community online. So uh, do you think that like be, with Screw Attack and all those websites, it paved like a cultural acceptance on YouTube and among other places to actively show video game content? That's an awesome question. Um, yeah, I, I do think that, you know, that there was a, a full group of websites that really uh, embraced gaming culture. And I think that's one thing that, that Screw Attack really did well. You know, Screw Attack was, um, you know, really embraced just the fun aspect of being a gamer, something that uh, wasn't ne necessarily uh, embraced by everybody. But now being a gamer is just something everybody does. I mean, literally everybody has an iPhone. Everybody's playing video games, whether you like it or not. You're, you're playing games in some way, shape, or form. And uh, Screw Attack just kind of made it okay to be a gamer. I wouldn't even say we made it cool. It was just, just okay to be a gamer. And I think a lot of people found acceptance in that. And then uh, from people uh, going on to Screw Attack and watching those videos, I think YouTube 
may have seen it and been like, well, you know, maybe there is something here. And, uh, and now YouTube is the number one place to find gaming videos anywhere in the world. Of course. Uh, so what kind of videos did you host and produce uh, via ScrewTech? Yeah, so, so we mentioned, uh, you know, we produced a lot of original content ourselves. Uh, a lot of the stuff we produced um, internally, we did a lot of, uh, you know, we did top tens and we had a series called The Video Game Vault. We did a lot of skits, um, you know, around gaming and stuff. But we also hosted uh, a lot of content creators that a lot of people may be familiar with if you watch YouTube videos, people like The Angry Video Game Nerd and uh, Game Theory, uh, a couple really giant channels that got their start on Screw Attack. So, uh, not only did we make content, but we also worked with people to uh, showcase their content as well. Of course. Um, so do you think, um, I guess overall, like, did like ScrewTech leave a lasting impression on the game community as opposed to other sites? Yeah, I hope so. I, I hope it did. You know, people, people today still talk about ScrewTech and uh, the various, various things that we did, whether it was the, uh, the website or the community or uh, the live events we did called SGC, Screw Attack Gaming Convention, or producing games, or just, you know, people talk about how Screw Attack was their childhood. And when, when they were teenagers, um, you know, that's how they spent their day, they, their days watching content. It wasn't, they wouldn't go home and watch Toonami they'd, or, or whatever, or Wheel of Fortune. They'd, they'd go home and they'd watch Screw Attack, and they'd go to GameTrailers.com, and they'd check out what the latest episode of uh, latest top 10 was, or the latest uh, Anger Video Game Nerd, or... Uh, whatever it may be. And, and that's, that's pretty cool. I, I, hope, I hope we made a lasting imp imprint. Um, I think if you were to play the Kevin Bacon game and look at the top creators in the video game space right now, Screw Attack is really just one or two degrees away from pretty much everybody. Either they started on Screw Attack or they uh, worked with somebody who, who uh, got their start on Screw Attack. Of course. And um, I, I honestly think Screw Attack was pretty, um, I would say, educational for someone who didn't know much about games, because that's the main reason I went on is because uh, I found out about, uh, I think it was like, I only had like a PlayStation 1, 2, and like a Wii. So I look and I see like this new Batman game and I'm like, whoa, what is this? And then I go on Screw Attack and I just learned all these, all about these consoles and games and fun facts. Could you see an argument that it, like it was educational and helped people find interests they liked? Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, I spoke at the Video Game Vault series and that entire series was built around uh, taking a look at classic retro games. And I've had, I mean, I don't even know, countless number of people say, you know, I heard you talk about this one game when you did a, a vault on it and I went out and checked it out. And now it's my favorite game. And, you know, we did hundreds of episodes of the vault and that's hundreds of games that people were exposed to because of that. And that's really, really cool. And those vaults were, you know, they're only two to three minute snapshots of these games right and the whole you know you, you, all these people they would they would watch these things and be exposed to something a game that may they may not have ever uh known about and you know watching a 10 20 minute video about a game you've never heard, heard about is a lot different than watching a two or three minute video where it's like oh, okay two or three minutes and i guess that's wrapping things up uh, where can everyone find you in your we're, content are we wrapping up for real this time yeah we're wrapping up for real oh, this time oh this is so fun oh i'm uh, sorry <laughs> Yeah, you can find me on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash Craig Skits or twitch.tv slash Craig Skits. That's S-K-I-T-Z, as uh, you can see back there on the screens and stuff. So uh, hopefully you can find me there. If you do, tell me you found me from this show, and I would love to, uh, love to say, what's up? <laughs> what's up? And that was our show. Of course, you can always like, comment, or subscribe. Tell us your thoughts, or even just add us at Twitter. I promise I'll be more active. I'm not doing good on that front, like literally at all. But with anyway, we're signing off. I'm Howard. And I'm David. You have a good night, everyone.